protest. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, now, we, we're doing the microphone because at least two or three people suggested they couldn't hear me. In the office, they asked, maybe it's their hearing is bad. <laughs> said, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> That's the case, and that's something I share with you. So if this is helpful, why not? Yeah. 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 said, well, you know, Christians talk about a Christian way of doing things. He said, a Jewish way of doing things. That's what Jews do. Now, when you look at the list that people have to fill those categories, it seems to me that you will find that the preponderance of them is interpersonal relationships. And that's, sorry, the that's why I don't need any more uh, talk among yourself. <laughs> 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 Silver saw me doing that. Sharon Silver said, well, I'm not Sharon, it's not bad. It's just trading one difficulty for another. <laughs> um, and she said, well, you know, why like Kleenex? You know, I'm trying to get David to get off the packages. I know he has, but you see, you convinced me. <laughs> so, so I'm using the Kleenex. And it's, it's a pain, right? I mean, it's somehow helpful, but it's, it's a pain. And, and Sharon, what do you do with them when when you're uh, when they're used and there's no waste space? Pocket yeah. <laughs> 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 I'll go for a sleep. I have to go for it. <laughs> All right, enough. <laughs> what do you do with these handkerchiefs? My daughter. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and what is the Jewish value in this? <laughs> Uh, I remember that uh, when Audrey Gordon was teaching for us years ago, she put together 
a list of things she called 50 Jewish values. And it'd be interesting to see what people would do if we asked them to put down 10, not the 10 commandments, but 10 Jewish values, what, what they would come up with. Uh, and I don't remember her list, but I remember saving it in a file and thinking, this is very smart, but I don't think half of us would agree on what those 50 Jewish values or ways of life are. But they come, come down, a lot of them, as I mentioned last week, to be, what is it to be a mensch? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about the sources of things people like to call Jewish values or Jewish way of life. Is this an organized list historically? No, because Jews have lived in so many different places and confronted so many different situations and interpreted the Torah so differently that it's not a standardized list. Are they generalities? Some of them are generalities, but more of them are more specific than you would think, and interestingly specific too. Do you know this phrase? because the devil is in the detail. Meaning what, you know, you don't quite get it. Whether something is ethically proper is not in the way it can be preached, but, in, but is in how you apply it in different situations to interpersonal relationships. So the application of how we treat other people where it comes from. That's the topic for today. Does it sound like we're getting close to it? Okay. Yes, it, we are. Um, uh, for, for example, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Great generality. And what does it mean in this situation where your neighbor is a no good? Or where you're a no good? And you know, that it's just like that. Um, <coughs> We did one last week. We did a sermon that a rabbi preached after he had insulted a fairly unattractive man on the road, if you remember this word. And he went in and he preached the sermon, and the sermon was, don't be a cedar unmoving. Be a reed. Flexibility. Well, and that sounds good too, except how do you apply it, apply it in certain situations? <coughs> Last introductory word, and then we're getting into text. Um, where do these values come from? If you had to break them down into three categories, which I think I've done. First, they come from legends and literature. We talked about that last week. Last week we came up with a number of legends. We read them, we saw what are the values in the legends? What do you learn from them? Jews t t uh, tell legends and they read and write literature. Also they write law and legal codes. And this is maybe the great part of the material from which the values come. Co law codes which certainly only applied to them when they were in charge of their, own, of their own life, but hopefully would apply to the whole Jewish people once there were a whole Jewish people which, were, which was uh, organizing its own life. And third, from culture around them, which they assimilated and felt, you know, this makes sense. Or this sounds like Jewish law, or this sounds just like Jewish values all by itself. So I think they come from her. I think they come from literature, and they come from Jewish law, and they come from the culture around us. And the stuff we're going to do today, and next week I'm not sure, but today I'm sure, <laughs> is Jewish law, especially as put together by Maimonides, we mentioned this last week in the Code of Jewish Law. Who remembers the dates of Maimonides? Is it about the 1200s, 1100s? Close. 
That's about as close as I get in historic terms, but pretty much in there. Who was able to look back on the Talmud and most Jewish law codes, which were important at that time, and organize them. Say this again, because it's important, and I'll say it one more time. Up to the time of Maimonides, there was very poor organization of all the law codes. They existed in a variety of books, and the way they often were linked to one another was not a cause effect, cause effect, legal if this happens. They were linked together almost by, you just said a word that reminded me of something else, which is the way we think, but it certainly isn't, doesn't make it easy to go back over a conversation. Or we, it may be a good, easy, you can go over a conversation that way, but you can't get back in a logical argument very well that way, because it just, it just doesn't happen for you. So, Maimonides came along, organized the laws and categories, and well, I said that this was the last introduction, but this is really the last introduction. <laughs> You're gonna ask, as we read this material, and I think it's fascinating, so my introduction is gonna end with you'll like it. Uh, I think as you, uh, what you'll ask is, is this real? I mean, did this happen in Jewish history? Were the Jews able to, to make decisions for themselves like this? And you know what? The answer is probably all of the above. When we were in charge of our own destiny, when, when the, the leaders of a country in which we lived were benevolent and let the Jews govern themselves and had their own civic civic organization. Yes, sure, it could happen. When the Jews were not in charge of their destiny, this was only what they talked about in show. The scholars got together and said, if we if things will go right for us finally, here's the way we'll guard our we'll, here's the way we'll we'll organize our, our state. So part of us part of it was para, paradisical. And if we ever are able to do it our way, here's the way we're going to do it. And here's what justice is going to be in our community. End of introduction. You should all have material. We are not going to read the material on the first or second pages. I decided it was too hard for me to, if we ever have time, we'll get back to it because it's very interesting. But I want you to turn to the second page, which says at the bottom of chapter 7. And this is the material, and we're going to not read everything here, but we're going to read some. It is, start, it is a positive commandment. Okay, I need a reader for about number one. Just anybody nice who likes to read. Arthur. Oh, by the way, my mind is 1135 to 1204. Oh, we're right there. Excuse me, it is so dangerous to have Googlers. And <laughs> right. I mean, it's great if you're right. 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 Okay, sorry. Arthur. This is an out of the to give church or what the Jewish people, according uh, to what is appropriate for the poor person, if this is within the financial capacity of the donor, and Deuteronomy 55 states, you shall certainly open your hand to the Leviticus 2535 states, and you shall support a stranger and a resident, and they shall live with you, and states, and your brother shall live with you. Why, is that a Jewish value? Sadaka, we have to, we've got to get to that, right? Yeah. Somebody made the translation in the English of Sadaka, which means righteousness and justice, into charity, which is from the Latin caritas, I believe, which means feeling, how you feel about somebody. When I was in Sunday school in South Shore Temple in South Shore, uh, and we, we used to have two banners in blue at the front. Uh, and uh, if your class had the best attention, every, every week you went to an assembly. Didn't call it service, it called it assembly. You went to the assembly, and if your class had given the most 
money for charity. You got to, to carry that banner back to your room at the end of the assembly, and you watched as this banner within the hands of the fifth graders that said, Hell High Charity. And the other and the other one said, Attendance. <laughs> Okay. Occasionally, you got a double hitter. Uh, well, oh, I saw, uh, you're right. Smart. Did you read and Google that? Did you? <laughs> um, so it's in my head too. The charity is a wonderful thing, but but it's a terrible translation. Was it called charity? Huh? Did they call it charity? In the Sunday, yeah, they did. At some some years later on. They went to, what did they go to in New Sydney? Karen Ami. Does that, does that reverberate for anybody? Karen Ami, which is a, which is a funny term. Fund for my people. Uh, you know, I, I know, I'm almost positive that's a, that's a biblical phrase, but I can't, can't access it. What does it mean? Though? It means fund, if you indeed, of my people. Now it sounds like, but I think this was pre-Israel, even pre-well-known Zionist movement, or pre-state. So it wasn't that. So it sounds like. It. Okay. But so that's that's what tzedakah means. But what a, a positive commandment. Thought on that? Yes. Something you should do. Rather than you to do something rather than to refrain from something. Right. You gotta go out and do it. <laughs> it almost says, well, it almost says you can't wait for it to happen. You go out and do it. You make a list at the beginning of the year what your tzedakah contributions are. You don't wait for it to come in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> Wish yeah, they did. Oh. <laughs> Somebody else would. Right, and that's an obligation. Comes to my mind. An obligation. An obligation, yeah. A positive commandment. Because there are negative commandments and positive commandments. Mm -hmm. How many do they think? Remind you. They think there are 365 do it, and 248 don't do it. It's easier mm -hmm. not to do it. Mm -hmm. It's easier not to. Yes. Harder to do. Harder to do, and more of those. More of those. Um, <clears throat> now, well, how much should I give? And that's going to be one of the issues here. Well, how much should you give? Does, what does it tell you? <laughs> Within your capacity, but what is appropriate for the poor person? Karl Marx. Huh? Karl Marx. Well, it's not, you know, if, if, organized, if organized nicely, <laughs> benevolently, it's not a bad idea. Yeah. The kibbutz wanted it to work very, very much. It just went too much against the laws of economics, it seems. Um, Okay. Yes. But charity isn't just exclusively a Jewish value. I mean, other religions would say that it's a Christian value or a Catholic value. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's so this great overlap here, right? Right. The circles overlap like this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. That's that's the introduction. That's that's maybe the guiding principle of you you give as much as you can but also take into consideration the need of the person. Marilyn, Which do we consider more? Yeah, Marilyn? Um, the footnote at the bottom. Yes. 141 says, the first person who receives it may not use it to pay a debt he owes, for it is given to him for his own personal expenses only. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I find that very strange. Okay, what note, what number note? Last one. Page, the, the chapter page. seven. Uh, page. It says 41. It says 41. So when was the 17th? I think it's the 17th. The very last line after that. Oh, I see. That is a bit busy. Oh, it just 
from oh, chapter six and verse seven. Yeah. yeah, right. In our constitution, we would not write that. Correct? No. Right. Susie? But is it true, Sadaka, when you are asking a person what they're going to do for it? Like a lot of people say, give the guy a court and say, don't go out by the person. So if you give, are you justified in asking where it's going and then taking it back and giving like what the guy's going <laughs> Right. It doesn't take much extra interpretation to turn it into that situation, does it? Where it what are you what are you doing? Yeah. Right. What are you doing with it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sure. I interpreted that if I give someone money because I feel that it was humble, that that person owes a debt, which a lot of hungry people may owe, it should go to feed that person before he's obligated to give it back to someone else. And in that context, it's not a bad thing, in my opinion. You like this as well, or you don't like this. One, two, three. Sure. Except, what if that person is using money to buy dope or to buy alcohol? Not to feed himself, but to feed a habit. Well, that's not, that's, okay. What I meant by this is when he says for his own personal yeah, expenses, Again, the homeless person, the hungry person, may have a debt, may owe you a hundred dollars. No, I totally agree with so you. So for that piece, right. I would say yes, have him see himself. Supporting any of it, I can't condemn. Well, but that's the thing, you don't know when you give it when you give someone money, you don't know what's going to happen to it. Personally, at the point at which I could no longer give everybody every panhandler a dollar, I would go into the nearest fast food place and buy some food and hand it to them. And most of the time, it's really hard to say half of the time, you may want I'm not going to let you get caught on this too long, but I see one hand. As a solution, I agree with you. I need three more, see, three more people. I saw Sharon, I saw Paula, and I saw uh, Okay. I think as a solution, uh, as the board promotes, help, uh, let someone help, uh, learn to help themselves. Let them uh, learn a trade or help themselves as opposed to just giving materialism. Uh, what, what's the, the Torah trace? Give a fish. Uh, yeah, teach, teach a man to fish. Teach, fish. teach, teach a man to fish. And have <laughs> fish There's a lot of that in the literature. Okay, agree, uh, agree to, with to Sharon, but that's why they say we shouldn't be handing money out on the street. There are other ways to support the people who need it so that they get their food. But then they should get their food and not owe it to somebody else. Jews are pretty sophisticated in this area of Tibet, right? Mm -hmm. It's in this conversation. Okay, but I understand. That Sharon and this Ethel. Okay, so uh, my daughter-in-law, uh, we were walking down the street there was somebody who looked very undesirable, and she walked over and gave him money. And I said, but what are you, is he gonna do with it? Much the same as you just said. And she said, that's not my job to worry about. My job is I have to give it. His job is to use it wisely. So you can't make those judgments. We're, we're asked to, to take care of. The other person has to now become the good person and use it for ways that are more meaningful and less destructive. Well, that was my point. It is the mitzvah is to give. That is the, like the schnorr comes on Shabbos, you can't deny it because you are fulfilling the commandment. So it's part of it is you're helping the person supposedly not to have strings attached, but your own you feel good if you give. That's the And I would think if Marilyn wants to talk, who does? I was just going to say, doesn't part of this come under according to what is appropriate for the per poor person? in number one. It is a positive commandment to give charity to the poor among the Jewish people according to what is appropriate for the poor person. If this is and I well, think that right, right. Not not every detail 
it keeps away from being a generality at, at some point in the conversation. Um, I think you'll find it interesting that a lot of the issues that you raise here <laughs> come right from here. And that the Jewish value of being of asking these questions or of trying to be very specific instead of just the generality come from here. Um, I, so I have two conflicting uh, instincts. One is not to keep anybody from talking, and yet it's also to move on. So I will try. To, I will try. I will try to quickly move on. Okay, and then and then keep you in my head. Who wants want to speak again? Uh, to get in, to get you in quickly. Okay. Uh, turn the page. We're at the top of page one sixty two. Uh, I'll do one. Anyone who sees a poor person asking and turns his eyes away from him and does not give him charity transgresses a negative commandment. As states, do not harden your heart or close your hand against your brother, the poor person. Now they found in the law just the opposite. Just the opposite. But it's, it's, it's a negative commandment also. It's not just that you should go do it. But if you feel moved, by the way, no matter what the first commandment said, to close your eyes and say, not for me today, it doesn't, doesn't apply to me, then you transgress a negative commandment. So you see, you've got it coming both ways. Uh, and it, it is. It's what you should do and what you shouldn't. And it finds biblical verses <clears throat> clearly for all of them. Okay, I want to get to three because this will give you some <coughs> conversation. This is also um, was one that Danny Siegel, when he spoke here years ago, uh, talked about as, as very what he thought was very significant, and he related it to an an episode of the wonderful sitcom Mesh. Uh, Anybody who remembers what that relationship was, you'll, you'll get a lot of praise from me. Okay, number three, let's have a reader. Sandy is up. Sandy, do you want the mic or your ear? I think I was teasing. I just want you to give me a muffler. <laughs> um, we are commanded to give a poor person according to what he lacks. If he lacks clothes, we should clothe him. If he lacks household utensils, we should purchase them for him. If he is unmarried, we should help him marry. <laughs> and for an unmarried woman, we should find a husband for her. Even if the personal habit of this poor person was to ride on a horse and to have a servant brought before him, and then he became impoverished and lost his wealth, we should buy a horse for him to ride and a servant to run before him. This is implied by Deuteronomy 15 8, which speaks of providing him with enough to fill the lack that he feels. You are commanded to fill his lack, but you are not obligated to enrich him. Wow. <laughs> well, how many people would how many people would buy that? At least 51 to 49%. How many people would say, yeah, that's more right than it is wrong? How many people would not? <laughs> You're a tough Jew. <laughs> um, that same in essence, the, the, the addictive. Give the alcoholic money to buy alcohol. That's basically what that is. Here, I'm going to let you go a little bit. So, so interesting. Arthur, then. Uh, yeah. the, the I, I have a dilemma. I'm an optimist. I'm always trying to fix people up. And my wife Susan nudges me and she says, You're sticking your business, giving your face in someone else's business. So, by doing the mitzvah, I'm making my wife angry. At me, so, I can't win. <laughs> I read that in an essay with you recently, Arthur Mint. Oh. More on this. 
Laura, this is Deanna. Okay, so full confession here. I actually have had a discussion about this exact topic. So I've had some time to think about it a little. And um, at first I was really upset about the concept of what do you mean I'm going to give conservatives and everything else. But if you stop and think about it, for the person who's giving to that, like Sharon's daughter in law in comments, and my job is to help them. And on the other hand, I think it all depends on our position in life. Because if we're somebody, we, we all are expected to give to that, but regardless of who we are, we always ask people who don't have much to give what they can. And are in a better place to give a lot, to give more. I mean, we don't tell people what to give, at least I don't think we do. Um, but the question then is, is, is if somebody in a more comfortable position before they fell into poverty, are that, does that mean we as a community only have to give them the bare minimum? Because some of the people who are contributing were in a lesser position financially than the wealthy person who fell poverty. Does that mean that somebody who is the CEO of a big company is now expected to live in a very, very different position in life because perhaps temporarily, I don't know the answer to this, so I didn't raise my hand either way when you ask. Because I also don't think that by feeding their habits, that's not something they lack. At the same time, you know, the highest level of charity, the stuff that I learned once upon a time that we did the E is that where the giver and the receiver don't know who each other are. That's one of the higher levels. So, That's the last page of what we're doing, okay. if we get there, <laughs> which I doubt. Um, but, you know, the other thing is that so many of these laws and commentaries were written when you knew everybody in your community, or if you didn't know somebody else, and it wasn't written in the 20th or 21st century where you don't even know everybody in your own neighborhood. So, it, you know, the town shicker isn't necessarily going to get money for that, but they might get a Shabbat meal. You know. What if it's a situation where two um, landowners live next to each other, you know, the great Gatsby, I'm thinking, which is beautiful mansion side by side. They've been neighbors all the time. Talk up, Susan. Oh, I'm sorry. What if, what if the two guys live side by side in beautiful mansions like great Gatsby? Take a picture there. And one guy does have a downfall. Maybe the, the guy next to him, an equivalent of giving a quarter to a, a homeless person, would be to lend him one of his horses and his servants just to get by the interim. So that that could justify giving a rich person. It, it sort of equates to just giving a quarter to a, a, a homeless person. Okay, one, two, and then. So I, I have a lot of problems with this because it's okay. It's the microphone. I have a lot of problems with this because it's predicated on what an individual lacks. Can, can we can we get the we, we can't hear back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So so <laughs> the the problem I give him the mic. We can't hear. He's being responsible. Would you do that? There's a, there's a lesson in that. Uh, so what I was going to say, that the problem I have with this is it's based on what an individual lacks. And the, the basic problem I have with it is that all of us lack something. You know, it changes over time. It gets better, it gets worse. Um, so, I mean, to help a man find a, an unmarried man find a woman, or a woman find an unmarried man, I think those are beautiful things, and we should help where we can. But the obligation to fulfill every lack or emptiness in another person seems too too big for me. Uh, this is my problem with this, and uh, I don't have an answer. I, I have struggled with this general question of Sadaka all my life in a lot of ways, and none of them have been satisfactory. Sharon, I see Phyllis, then I see Mark. Okay. All right. So I, I always have a difficult time with the wealthy person having to be lifted back up into this position because uh, how, how can you balance the, the need for uh, uh, respect, you know, and, and 
comfort as opposed to somebody who needs the basics. It just doesn't feel right. But yet, it was explained, I think, by you, that there was something about the shame that somebody who has and now doesn't have that is deeper than just not having. They, they've lost their face. They, they, they can't walk in the same place that they used to walk. That they, that, that inability is very profound. And it's not a measure of enough food on the table, but it's how you present yourself to the world. Thank you. Elvis? I was going to say the same thing in different words. It's, a, it's an issue of dignity. It's an issue of humiliation and a loss of dignity. And I think that's bigger than a loss of material goods. And I think that it's an important piece. I think it's closer to death than a, a, a loss of material. And that, that, what, I, what I find meaningful on this is that it gives, you can never think of this side. We never think of this side and quantify it. But, but ha having empathy with someone who has essentially died. But in so many ways, the the inside feeling is something you must have some empathy with. So I'm so I like the fact that this is in the mix. May I tell you the, the mash story quickly? Yeah. yeah. And you, if I get this wrong, jump in, all right? <laughs> Wait a minute. She doesn't know the story, but I told her to jump in. <laughs> it's a little, little later. Um, Colonel Potter, you remember nothing mentioned yeah. Colonel Potter? Uh, loved horses, and somebody in, in Korea found a horse that was loose and brought him in, it was a fine horse, and Potter was so happy to have this horse, and he was riding around the, the camp with it, and they captured a Korean general, on the others, a North Korean general, who was in his uniform and in dignity, and somehow they realized that, he, that this he was a prisoner, but he was used to riding a horse. And Potter said, he can ride my horse. And the man rode around the camp riding the horse. And that was the issue was, that, that, that was it. Uh, so there is a, a, sense, a sense of despair. What can you do? You can't give somebody a, a cheese sandwich, but you can give them a ride on the horse. <coughs> I'm moved by this, this, even though I probably agree with the great majority of you who said, this doesn't work. But when you think about Guantanamo, you see what it's like. Uh, too much political. It's cancer, yeah. right? Okay, I want to move, but uh, Sharon. Many years ago, I met a woman whose home had been totally decimated. And she was very bitter because the help that she was given by an organized charity was commensurate with the uh, lack of, she, she didn't have a beautiful home, she, she was living minimally. And the person down the block who, who not only had a beautiful home and the cars and everything else, but also the job and the lifestyle to afford it. Now this was not, this was an act of nature. And the charity gave them so much more than they did her with that feeling that, yes, this house, their loss was greater. But then the other side of that story was they had the wherewithal and they had the ability to earn the funds to replace where she and her husband absolutely did not even a greater devastation. And that always sort of stuck with me because until then, it, it didn't occur to me that you know those, those different levels are. We're moving on. Uh, okay, uh, number five. That same page, 162. When a poor person. Another reader for a when a poor person. I read, would you? Uh, 
when a poor person comes and asks for his needs to be met and the giver does not have the financial capacity, he should give according to his financial capacity. How much? The most desirable way of performing the mitzvah is to give one-fifth of one's financial resources. Oh, a giving one-tenth is an ordinary measure. Giving less than that reflects parsimony. A person should never refrain from giving less than a third of a shekel a year. A person who gives less than this has not fulfilled the mitzvah. Even a poor person who derives his livelihood from charity is obligated to give charity to another person. Now, I put this in because I, don't, I, don't, I can't buy the earlier figures either. I mean, that must be a different world. It, just, it doesn't equate to the things we, can, we would consider proper kind of giving. I put it in here because of the last line, just to emphasize to you that it's probably something you know, but uh, this is, if you put this, talk about Jewish values, I would put this pretty, pretty high up, where even a person who derives his livelihood from charity has got to give some of it back to somebody else. You're, you're, you're still part of the community, and, and that reminds you that you're still part of the community. Not just a taker, you're a giver. And, and I think this was enforceable, Merlin. I read a story once about, it uh, was told by a young man who church was uh, having everybody contribute to a poor family. And his family was poor, but they scraped together things to donate to this basket or whatever. And then the church people came to their house. And, they, and he was mortified that even though they were poor. They had given charity, thinking it's for somebody else, and they got it back themselves. And he, he was just mortified that they were considered the poorest of the family in the church. No, no, no. They were the recipients. They were the recipients of the okay. I, I, That's the only part of this one I wanted to make sure you, you knew. So. They were still but, fulfilling the obligation of Sadaka. They were doing the commandments. No matter how poor you are, you are giving the commandment. You have to do the commandment. Okay. And, and, and it's not a matter of, it places you in the community. I mean, are you in or are you out of this community? Are you those who are taken care of or are you the take caretakers also? It's a big difference. It's also a dignity. Yeah, of course it is. And, and, you'll get, and you'll get a thank you card from the UGA. Yeah. Too. Giving. You'll get a thank you card from the UGA, and you can take it off your, your income tax, right? Because you didn't give a lot, but you gave something. And you, get a, and you, had, you had a deduction in that line, Terry. Um, if you're poor, does it count if you give of yourself, of your time? I mean, people who go to food pantries, and yet they're a volunteer at the food pantry. So, they may not be giving money or food, but they're giving up their time and with themselves. You know, one of the one of the issues that comes up fairly often is emotional help or financial help. Now, Judaism is, is emphasized a lot, maybe more than Christianity. Uh, real, tangible help for the poor. Don't just give them nice words. You know, give, give them that which they need. There's also a sense, and you'll find that in here too, of being sensitive to, yes, that's that's very important. Like spending time to be a shavcha to somebody who will work, who helps help somebody get a mate and set up a house for the, for the, for the bachelor or the, or the widower or the widow. With a bed first, right? Mm -hmm. Food and a bed and a house. And now you're ready to talk to go out uh, camping, right? Mm -hmm. Do they still say that? <laughs> Who they say? I guess not. We all know what it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when Bobby was next day, if you would, if it's not too late. <laughs> I thought you, I thought you wanted to had something to say, and I missed you. Excuse me. Okay, Irene and Sandy. Um, the part where uh, about them going to the poorest people in the congregation, isn't it somewhere said that you're not supposed to embarrass the person when you're giving the charity? No. Right in these thin pages. <laughs> right here, turn, turn, turn the end. Okay. okay, Sandy, then Joni, then Mark is moving on. I just want to give a universal BJBE uh, spin on this. 
and the right of people to have their dignity. If you recall, 100 years ago, when I was president of the congregation, we had a lot of uh, newly arrived Russian Jews who came to us regularly to be tutored in English. A lot of us sat down and spoke English, it was great. And then someone proposed at a temple board meeting that we allow them to buy tickets, or we give them tickets to high holidays. And I said, no, I think we ought to charge them $5 for a ticket so that they feel a sense of, of worth and of dignity. And that that was more reflective of who we are as a community. Not that we embrace you and we want you to embrace us in, in that way. And that's what we did. And we had a lot of $5 dollars turned in for the tickets that year. The late Arnold Wolf would probably say, that's great, and don't be too proud of yourself. No. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly what I said. No, none of us were. No. I said, make sure you don't. Oh, uh -huh. uh, that probably was in our heads, right? And she was surrounded by us. Yeah, there was a big question. So we always needed a gadfly who would say, <laughs> say things like that to us and say, I love you, right? Uh, okay, okay. Did I miss somebody? Good. Oh, Jody. Yeah. I was just going to. What Sandy said was basically what I was uh, aiming toward also. When we have a fundraiser like a resale, we always make sure that we price everything at a very low price so that people are buying something instead of it being given to them, that they have to pay a little bit for it to keep their dignity. Get it. I get it. Okay, okay. Where are we? Where do we have this? Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, six. Six. The story of the schnorrer. Uh, let's read it out loud and I'll tell you how it relates to temple life. Barbara. And Barbara, isn't it nice that we got a mention of the Russian Conversation Club? Yes. How many years, how many years did that go? Okay. Is it still? It's not good. No, it's not. Because they all learned English. Right. right. How many years? Oh, I must have been about 15. One of the most terrific temple programs yeah. built to be proud of and just to enjoy. Yeah. And friendships made. Yeah, we're so friendly. Okay, number uh, six. Oh, six, six, six. Here you go. When a poor person whose identity is unknown says, I am hungry, provide me with food. We do not investigate whether he is a deceiver. Instead, we provide him with sustenance immediately. If he was unclothed and he said, clothe me, we investigate whether he is a deceiver. If we are familiar with him, we clothe him according to his honor immediately, and we do not investigate the matter. Wow. So here, so here we are. What are we talking about? Well, well, somebody knocks on the door of the temple. This used to happen on yeah. National Avenue because there were a lot of people really down in the block who had passed by 20th and National. National. Mm -hmm. The temple was there and uh, we'd be looking for uh, a handout or something and then uh, we would often send them to the lunch counter at the, at the leader store, half a block, block and a half away, where one of our members owned the place and uh, give them a chip for a meal or something like that. It's something does that sound right, ladies? Mm -hmm. we did. So, uh, but there, there are um, there are legions of these men and women too, who are sort of on the on the circuit, who go to synagogues and tell the story. And often, now that there's email, the rabbis and the administrators share some of the stories, so we know the stories ahead of time when they come, and we know that it's not the emiss. Um, and how do you, and you, you can investigate all these folks, but you can't give them all as much as they need either, no matter what your resources are. Um, so the issue was always how much, how many questions do you ask of them, and what if they're everybody's taking taking your your tzedakah funds? So it's, it's it was that's not a terribly important issue, a big money issue, but it was it was something ethically. Disturbing. It was a thorn, uh, and not not because we didn't because we didn't know how we should be acting. Okay, now look what this one says. If he's hungry, 
You feed them. You don't ask any questions. If you could be sure. But if that's what it says, how can you question that? But if he's not got the right clothing or nothing warm enough, then you try and find out. I think this is an attempt to walk a line here that's as humane as possible without opening up the door to every Jake, Charlie, Joseph. But if you're familiar with him, if you know him, you treat him just like anybody else and you don't investigate him. I agree. Um, I think we should investigate him sometimes because sometimes organizations, when we try to go through the organization direction, the United Way or something, and I don't want to mention any, any one in particular, but there are certain ones have been known to not to put every dollar that, that you give, even of, even the majority of the dollar, into what, where it's supposed to go. It may go towards salaries. It may toward it may go toward um, whatever you know, and and then and then you feel cheated, you know, you feel betrayed that where you when you want to give the right way. One more on this. I was going to ask Camille uh, because she's the township official and her township has a food pantry. If someone comes in and they say that they're hungry, do you give them food and then they have to register? But you do give them food when they come in, <coughs> even if they're not in their township. When we direct them to other resources. F food, food is too too much of a necessity to stop and worry about details. We were walking out of a restaurant one night some years ago. There were nice and loud. You're almost there. <laughs> we were walking out of a restaurant one night a couple of years ago, and there were three couples. Everybody's carrying leftovers, and a panhandler approached us, and he says, "I don't want any money. I just want your food." And he took all six boxes of leftovers, and my heart broke. My heart just broke because he must have been very hungry. Okay, down, down to, oh, sorry. You were also walking out of the restaurant, and I had food in my hand, and a, a, a person, I thought was a street person, opened the door, and I said, here, I have my food. He says, no, I'm, I'm a patron, I'm going in to eat. <laughs> Start Jewish jokes by saying so. A Jewish man was walking down. <laughs> now a Jewish joke starts, so we were walking out of a risk. <laughs> I think one of the greatest uh, tzedakah organizations we have here in the Chicago area is the Ark. We should all look to the Ark and find what find out what they're doing. Maybe even help them if we can. They have a wonderful support system, and they're helping Jews all over the area. They now have a satellite in North. Oh, we have a few few of our good BGB folks there, Mark Swartz. Yeah. Right. So, and I know Weiner doing this. Mark Swartz. Oh, I know Weiner. Michelle Chutes. No, uh, Michelle, Michelle works for him. Michelle. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, number nine on page one sixty four. Oh Lord, we're never going to make it. Yeah. Never going to make it. Somebody, what number nine? Please. When a poor person does not desire to take charity, we trick him and give it to him as a present or as a loan. When a rich man starves himself because he is miserly with his money, using it for neither food nor drink, we do not pay any attention. <laughs> Why do you not pay any attention to him? He's Meshuggah. <laughs> So the second one, I don't quite understand the second one, but I, the first one, I, mean, I don't know how the, if this happened, you know, you have, to, you have to ask a lot of these. Was this real? Was this based on an actual situation? But um, you, you know people who are too, too proud or for some reason will not accept the kind of help that might be available. I mean, so what's the reason? So what do you do? Well, would it work to trick him? Who knows? Bank account. <laughs> but 
if it were possible. And the idea, of course, of giving him a trick, giving him as a present or as a loan, you, know, you, you try to work around, you work around his mission to us. Just because you care for the person. And anything more to be said about that? For dignity. Huh? You're maintaining the person's dignity. Unless they, unless they find out. Yeah. Well, right? Yeah, to do something, they would say, beyond, behind my back. <coughs> But it's their birthday, so you give them something exceptional rather than, yeah. I mean, you do it under different... Could you help me? I need a hand in the shop for the next couple of months. Some of your spare time. Um, oh, number 10. I think Jews weren't tough, huh? Jews could be tough. Somebody, number 10. When a person does not want to give charity or desires to give less than what is appropriate for him, the court should compel him to give strikes for rebellious, rebellious conduct. Until he gives the amount it was estimated that he should give, he take possession of his property when he is present and expropriate the amount that is appropriate for him to give. We expropriate property for the sake of charity, even on Fridays. <laughs> Look at number 30 down. By the way, the notes are not mine. The notes are the, the rabbi fucking some years ago put this all together in this translation, and they're not cons they're considered his way of explaining it. So if you don't agree in something with my mother, <coughs> okay. If you don't agree with him, you're probably as smart as he. <laughs> maybe not that, but he's not, not as high as an authority. Uh, what about that one? Guess we're glad that doesn't happen anymore, and that, and that it's not not part of. But some people, and there may be a lot of people here, would agree with you that uh, the uh, heavy-handed measures of uh, tzedakah collectors and organizations have turned Jewish people off, as well as done wonderful things for causes. But you, but I, and, and if uh, I think everybody has thought of at one time or another, as, as you do, and, and some, sometimes still do. But I guess our feeling that it's... Here comes a nice person. 
an escapee from preschool, <laughs> looking, looking for Tara. <laughs> Some, some Jews win battles with other Jews. That may be one. I can tell you about that. I asked about that a few years ago. Yeah. And what did they tell you? Well, I said I find it really offensive, and please listen to me anonymously. So we're always listed anonymously, which any of you can also request. And I said I really find this book of life to be un-Jewish and counter to what we're taught. And what they said is they did take either one or two years off. Right. And the amount of dollars that they raised went so far down. Exactly. That they reinstated again. Yeah. Either that's MS or that's a mice. It was true. Yeah. Well, I believe they said it was true. Well, they, 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 but anybody who doesn't want to list it with an amount, you ask them, and then every year they send you a note saying, Do you still want to be listed? Do you still want to be not listed? That's okay, but you know we can list you now. And every year I say, so they will ask you every year, but you can say no, thank you. Or you can say. Back, back, from, back from the Book of Life to my Maimonides. They won't offer you the anonymous. You have to ask it. Now, here's, some, here's something. Um, oh, uh, oh, see, here's something on, on the embarrassment thing. Number 11. I'll do this one, okay? It is forbidden to demand and to collect charity from a soft-hearted person who gives more than is appropriate to charity, or from a person who causes himself difficulty and gives to charity collectors so that he will not be embarrassed. When a charity collector embarrasses such a person and asks him for charity, the charity collector will be subjected to retribution in the future, as implied by Jeremiah, I will visit my providence on those who pressure him. It doesn't say what's going to happen to him. The implication is he's going to have not so, not so bright a future. Um, well, this, you know, other than the specifics, how do you know who's embarrassed by something? How do you know who's soft, who's soft hearted? Still, that, that whole issue that Michael raised, I know, in the minds of uh, many of you, and it's right here too, not in exactly the details, the specifics that we would deal with it, because we would say what is soft type of pain and why didn't we give? And, but here at the principle, uh, you just cannot force someone to go beyond what they can do, and force them, not hit them, but you can embarrass them, which is worse. And, and of course, the, the embarrassment possibility is, is in the Book of Life, where you didn't give as much as you gave last year, but must have had a bad year. Um, here's one. Here's one that you, Stanley. I think pertinent to this is I recall an occasion where my father got a call from our congregation in San Francisco that they had put him down for a certain amount of money for donations and having fundraising. And you could imagine his kind of reaction. <laughs> they just announced the amount, right? Yeah, and they let him go. Mm -hmm. Not a happy Jewish man. <laughs> Bobby. Years and years and years ago, we had an occasion to go to an Orthodox show on Yom Kippur. Oh, yeah, they locked the door. And <laughs> they started from the building with Mr. Goldberg. How much are you giving this year? And <coughs> went through the entire congregation. For me, it was something. But if you want to see what's kept the Jews going all these years, that's probably one strand of it. Right. <laughs> Maybe not the one we're at is right. But you've got to keep this place. Who, who, who made these people judges of who can give and how much people can give? I mean, 
The people. The people. As long as you buy into the system. No, if somebody, somebody is judging how much somebody is giving, and they have others. Who, who, is, can, who feels they're powerful enough, let's say, to be a judge of how much Phyllis could give, or how much Lynn could give, or should be given? Obviously, there are at least a, a minority of people who think they can do it. Right. And if we give them the power to do it, right. we're complicit with us. Phyllis. But if this is written at a time when the community is very small, you know who has that big house on the hill. And you know this is a small community, maybe only 200 families. Everybody knows everybody. And I can understand this. But you know, that guy should be giving, and he's not. And everybody knows he's not. Force him. <laughs> then, because we know what he's got. And it's a small community, I get it. But we don't oh. know. We don't know what they only think they know. Wait, 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 wait. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> I got one, I got two. I got two. Choices. Um, well, I'm going to go back to the question that Mr. Kelly Appropriate. What's appropriate? Who measures appropriate? How do you measure appropriate for yourself? Uh, not in this code. They give them, they, they, but they do give you a sense that it's not black and white. No. That it's, it's got some, some give and take in it. Appropriate seems to mean that. Although in the other case, they talked about giving 20%. Wow. Okay, wow, suddenly suddenly I got trees growing up here. But, uh, um, based on what Phyllis said, I've been sitting here thinking, we are judging all this from our perspective. And we can't do that because it just came from a walk Yes, and it's got at the heart of it some, some specific and general values that uh, I think are pretty, pretty, yeah. pretty important. I think it's amazing. Uh, okay, sure. Okay, so uh, years ago I remember going to one of the divisional dinners from Federation, and many of these people who were well established, and we were very new and young, and hearing them giving hundreds of thousands of dollars in pledging from their foundations, no less, and, and we were giving, you know, okay, what would two weekends out for dinner be? Let's do that. It felt very good about it, and it made us feel so small. However, sometimes seeing what a peer can do, you have to come from a culture of giving. I have friends who were not raised with a culture of giving. And they have to be prone. So, you know, I have to, oh, it's that time of year, I have to start thinking where I'm giving. It, it, you have to learn sometimes that it's okay and you'll still be able to walk and you'll still be able to save for college. It's okay to give and it makes you feel rich. So if you have enough left over, even if you don't have a lot, it's okay to learn and it's okay to give. What, what, what a hot topic this is. <laughs> I didn't think it would be quite this hot. <laughs> sure. On the subject of what Sharon was saying, I remember that President Reagan gave less of a percentage of his of his income than we did. <laughs> oh, Amen. <man. laughs> That's a good end. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. Look at 13. This really, I think in Jewish culture anyway, has been a way of thinking about tzedakah. A poor person who is one's relative receives priority over all others. The poor of one's household receive priority priority over the poor of one's city. I think a household means here those whom you employ. And the poor of one's city receive priority over the poor of another city as implied by Deuteronomy, etc. Is that something that you learned that fam at least at least the family part? The family, I mean that the whole as Jews emigrating from Germany, Europe, looked for, and hopefully an agency would help, but looked for a family member, a distant family member, who was Mishpacha, only because of the 
very thin connections, and having a sense that that person would, would deep down feel the obligation, and in most cases that, that was correct. So if you've learned that in some emotional way from your family as you were growing up, and, and the people in the block, you know, the town, I don't know, we don't, don't live quite the same way, but in the same shtetl, where, where at least some of this you can tie it to. That was, that was certainly true. Turn the page, please. Uh -huh. Okay. I don't know if this ever happened, but you can see what they thought about. Number nine, somebody a reader. I were reading about Gentiles. Get Gentiles into the mix. It is forbidden for a Jew to receive charity from a Gentile in public. If he is unable to subsist on the charity given by the Jews, and it is impossible to receive charity from the Gentiles in private, it is permitted. When a Gentile king or official sends money to the Jews for charity, do not return it to him so as not to jeopardize peaceful relations with the king. Instead, we take the charity from him and give it to the Gentile poor in secret so that the king will not give it. A chacham Smart, just smart Jewish way to do things. By the way, I, this may all be all be in, in their mind. Uh, was there a Gentile king who gave charity to the Jews? Well, there were benevolent kings, benevolent princes who ran the land. I mean, it could, could have happened. Probably was not an everyday occurrence. <laughs> so why don't you take it from him in public? Pride. Yeah, pride. It's the same with the Jewish community was failing to us that you have to take from the Gentile. Oh, yeah, yes, it's a, it's a shanda. It's a shanda and a harpa. There's a new part of the expression for it. Something is a shanta and a harpa. A harpa is uh, something, something close to what it's a shame and a, and a bad name. So if you want to add, somebody say, oh, that's a shanta. You know, it's not only a shanta, it's a harpa. <laughs> so, like to add to your vocabulary. Okay. Um, now, what, yes? I guess what's bothering me is the definition of poor and why somebody Cave for you know, is it something of their own cause, or is it a natural disaster, or something happens? Likewise, uh, you know, how does somebody gather wealth, and, and how much can they give, and, and where do they fit in, and, and who decides? And, you know, the bigger picture, and is it shared, and you know, all these other issues. So there's other factors that go into all of these decisions. Well, if you have a court of rabbis whom you trust, you go to them and try to get the answer. You just decide for yourself. But you're right. It's, it's, it's certainly it's, it's the ongoing question. And when when they write a mission in Torah after this one, you know, they'll deal with things like that. But you're right. Okay, we're gonna oh, wait. Okay, let's let's go on. Oh yes, we talked about this last week, and then we come to it. number ten. Number ten. Uh, <clears throat> on page 172. Somebody? <laughs> Somebody? Oh, yeah. The redemption oh. of captives receives priority over sustaining the poor and providing them with clothing. Indeed, there is no greater mitzvah than the redemption of captives. For a captive is among those who are hungry, thirsty, and unclothed, and he is immortal. He is in immortal peril. If someone pays no attention to his redemption, he violates the negative commandments. Do not harden your heart or close your hand. Do not stand by when the blood of your neighbor is in danger, and he shall not oppress him with exhausting work in your presence. And he has negated the observance of the positive commandments. You shall certainly open up your hand to him, and your brother shall live with you. Love your neighbor as yourself, Save those who are taken for death, and many other decrees of this nature. There is no mitzvah as great as the redemption of captives.
That's wow. what Israel is doing right now. With their right. captives, with their, with their in, the, in the issue of right retaining captives who are uh, who are kidnapped, and the Israeli army issue for, for a while. Why? 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 Why?
it was, which was not exactly our thoughts. Um, but there was, there was almost a sense of reality that we might, we might take that money and use it for some kind. Well, you could only for use it for a mitzvah, and the congregation would have to decide what that mitzvah would be, etc. But isn't this isn't this interesting? But finally, if you got it up, you're not going to tear it down. You can sell it for anything, right? Get the money from the other. Okay. Now 15. We've got four and a half minutes. 15. I'm going to drive on ahead for four and a half minutes. A woman perceives, perceives precedence over a man with regard to being sustenance, clothing, and to be redeemed from captivity. No. Everybody can understand that, right? It's not that the rationale is that it's common for a man to beg, I guess, for mercy, but not for a woman. And this is extremely, and at the, the, the end of it's there, but you know, okay. is there one, oh, I have no choice, I, I cannot choose which one to do. So I'll do the one that everybody knows, but it's good to be reminded of. See, I took out some of the stuff at the beginning and we're still being okay. Let's find... You can take, the, take this material because it is about the synagogue has to appoint members of a, of a giving committee, of a tzedakah committee, and what their rules are, how they have to handle them. There are eight levels in charity, each of that page, 180. There are eight levels in charity, each level surpassing the other, the highest level, the end which there is a person, the person who supports a Jew by giving him, by giving him a present or a loan and being in a partnership with him, or finding him work, which is exactly what we said before, right? So that is, so that, his hand will be forfeit, and he won't have to, have to ask for help. Number eight there. A lower level is one who gives charity to the poor without knowing to whom he gave, and without the poor person knowing from whom. And now I have to go into the book. <laughs> I thought I was better organized when I was here. Okay. Without the poor person knowing from whom he received. This type of giving was exemplified by a secret chamber that existed in the temple. A person giving would make a donation there in the chamber. Poor people would derive their livelihood in secret. Even people who were thought to be wealthy but lost all their money could take from there without anybody knowing they did. A lower level, when the giver knows to whom he's giving. You don't know me. To you, somehow. No, I can't say you're welcome. That's one of the problems. Saint sages would go in secret and throw money into the doorways of the poor. I think probably not a good idea. <laughs> A lower level than that is an instance where the poor person knows from whom he took, but the donor doesn't know to whom he gave. Ah. The great sages, they say, would bundle coins in a sheet, hang them over the shoulders, and the poor would come and take them so that they would not be embarrassed. Ah. This is my street corner, not yours. Joe <laughs> <laughs> shouldn't be sorry about it. It's a great idea. A lower level is giving the person in his hand before he asks. Don't ask. A lower level is giving him after he asks. What'd you say? <laughs> A lower level is giving him less than what is appropriate, difficult word, but with a pleasant countenance. <laughs> you have a good time with this quarter. <laughs> <laughs> it's better to give a dollar begrudgingly than okay. to give the quarter. You gotta take the book. <laughs> and the last is uh, giving not enough and with sadness. Over the, over the 
rotten face. Is how you give your attitude? Well, sometimes, sure. You know, don't, don't say it's only funny. Sometimes it's, I can't, but, but, but something, something that makes the person a person. Out of the goodness of your heart. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but your chambers are pretty tight. Your chambers are pretty tight. <laughs> All right, we've, we've I'm come to the end of another lovely session. I just want to brag for a minute about my, a couple of my kids. For uh, my eldest son, Spartan but he spent a great deal of time coming up with what he wanted to do for his ministry project. And what he came up with was kind of all of this. And he decided that he, he already done a unit in school and he understood about the homeless and about the abuse of materials and substances they would take. And he tried to really figure out how can we use our stuff that we collected all the time to extend itself as far as possible. And he didn't like that most charities had overhead and salaries and how to do. Well, in the end, he ended up deciding we were going to take the money we had and we were going to go to Costco because it's cheaper than any of the downtown stores. We ended up for $88 buying with Eli Shaw, who was the other one, another temple member. We bought two large bags of food for each person. And we didn't just give it to them on the street. We first of all asked them if they were hungry to make sure that they weren't going to dump it. And then we listened to their stories and we talked to them. So my little, almost 13 year olds would give with an open heart before being asked, I mean all this stuff. And they really gave a great deal of thought. And I just wanted to share that when we talk about how little you need to be able to give, these are kids who had no ego. They were saving up birthday money and allowance money. And this is how they, it was all their money that they went into it. So I just wanted to share we talked about all the skepticism of people who use the money for drugs, but these were a dozen different people on the street who were very appreciative, and it was really interesting their story. That's great. Tell them Yashikoa. Thank you. I have to go. My, my ride is in fact. <laughs>